Medical Center, the Graduate Center, uh, CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. Again, it's a sunny, hot day um, in Manhattan where one thinks the asphalt might melt or <laughs> might leave a footprint uh, on the streets. And um, it's another day on planet Earth. We think uh, hopefully a good one. And one of the reasons is, you know, because we have the great, great puppeteers or people from the world of puppetry with us. Uh, it's a great day. We love that art form. We think it is so important, at least uh, in the Western world, often a slightly overlooked even so among real theater people. Um, they uh, are so highly respected and their work is of significance. So we have three uh, great speakers with us as a little note from the Siegel Center side. Um, it's a big day for us too. It's Siegel Talk 150. Uh, we can't believe it. It's a, a, a long series, a little endurance a marathon. So we are proud of it. And it was such a privilege to listen over a year now, over a year and a half almost, um, no, not really yet, but um, a, over a year to so many artists from around the world who have made a difference or as Mila Rao says, agents of change who have been on the right side of history, the right side on the fight for social justice and, um, and who are also great, great human beings. Um, one of the things that will come out of this uh, is we will host a 24 hour um, kind of a marathon with our Indian uh, and colleagues um, who have done uh, so much to help uh, the Indian population around Bangalore and uh, everywhere in India to deal with uh, COVID and uh, the, the horrific uh, situation in India. And as a symbol to all the theater artists who really helped to make the planet a better place and during that time, it might also be coming slowly to an end of our official Corona series uh, or focus on it, but we will continue um, to talk about theater and art. But as an ending after 150, we will do in July a 24 hour marathon to really raise awareness mm -hmm. of the really hard situation that is um, out there. And uh, Siegel Center will always participate. It's also as an announcement on September 5th, uh, the Memorial Day weekend, we will hope to help organize readings all around the city in all five boroughs of New York to um, uh, honor uh, the people who died. Uh, we will uh, get uh, 100 little uh, speakers and microphones and we hope to read letters uh, from people um, who died or letters written for them, to them, uh, or imagined letters that might come back inspired by uh, uh, Odile Cartes' great work in Rwanda. And so we will also let you all know more about this as our next step to get involved in New York City itself. But let's come back to what is really important and why we are here today. And to everybody out there again, thank you for listening. If you're catching us uh, today, uh, maybe the first time of a repeated time, it's uh, so great to have had uh, all these listeners. Um, we got so many comments and how meaningful it was for them. Oh, when we made things wrong and we said something that wasn't right and we got corrected, <laughs> but you know, really we got uh, such, um, such a great response and it helped us to go over. So today we have with us Claudia Orenstein from Hunter College. We have Paulette Richards uh, in Atlanta and we have uh, Manuel Antonio uh, Moran uh, with us. And I'm going to read a little bit about their bias so we get it uh, behind us of the it work, but tell us uh, where are you now and what time is it where you are in the moment? Paulette, maybe you start. Yes, um, I'm sitting in my studio in Atlanta and it is 12.03 in the afternoon. Well, that's close to our time. And uh, <laughs> Manuel, where are you? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, I am upstate New York, actually, in Sullivan County. Um, and it's the same time, 12. <laughs> Four now, actually. <laughs> Claudia. Uh, I'm in uh, Manhattan, and it's also, uh, oh yeah, 12.04. <laughs> and I also just wanted to say bravo to you, Frank, for 150 oh. of these. I yes. Think. Well done, well done. Thank you. Yeah, it's like David Plain territory, when he like being underwater, you know, for, <laughs> uh, for a long time. And um, but uh, I hope it was a small contribution really to, to, to understanding of the world we were in and uh, to create some meaning and uh, it really helped me uh, personally. So let me talk to you all a little bit about our guest today, Manuel Antonio Moran, who is here, was born in Puerto Rico in San Juan. And he has been actor, singer, writer, composer, puppeteer, theater and film director. 
and producer in his uh, home country in Latin America, in Puerto Rico and Europe and the United States. He's a founder and artistic director of SEA, did I say it right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is the Society of the Educational Arts with offices in Puerto Rico, Florida and New York City. You can uh, look it up on the web. Uh, it's teatrosea.org. And for um, uh, celebrating now 35 years you know, of existence and they have made a real a difference um, in the field and uh, offered entertainment alternatives with real cultural and artistic value and educational quality for kids, youth, adult and through bilingual educational programs, workshops, seminars, theater and also puppet work. That's uh, <laughs> something what we will uh, talk about. We have uh, the great uh, also Paulette Richards with us. She's a, a puppet artist and an independent researcher. She holds a PhD in French civilization from the University of Virginia and has taught at Georgia Tech. She has taught uh, animatronic puppetry workshops at the Friends School of Atlanta and many, 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 many other places. The Center for Puppetry Arts, Puppeteers of America 2017 Festival. She co-curated Living Objects, African-American puppetry exhibits at the Institute and Museum of Puppetry in 2018 and 19. And she is currently curating an exhibit of African-American puppetry at the Center for Puppet Arts. And her book, Object Performance in the Black Atlanta is forthcoming from the Great Rutledge, a publishing house. And you're also working on a new book, right? You said, and we will hear about it. And uh, she mm -hmm. is uh, asking for contributions if anybody is listening. And then we have with us a close friend um, of the Siegel Center, Claudia, who also um, helped us to put this group together. We have done many events around puppetry together at the Siegel Center over a decade. And she's a professor at Hunter College and the Graduate Center. And her publications include Women and in Puppetry, Critical and Historical Investigations with Alisa Mello and Caridad Aslex, uh, The Rutledge Companion to Puppetry and Material Performance, a very important book. Encourage everybody um, also to get it as he did it with Dacia Posner and the great uh, John Bell from the great small works. Um, she was a dramaturg um, for the Wind Up God Chronicle um, with uh, Tom Lee and Nishikawa Kirovi. Um, Shanks Marx, and um, she's a member of uh, Unima USA, if not one of the main forces actually behind it. She's the associate editor of the Asian Theatre Journal and her current book projects, one of the many, many things she does uh, is Thinking Through Puppets, Essays on Puppet Dramaturgy, um, or, and uh, with uh, Tom Cusack, who also uh, has been often at the Siegel, uh, Puppet and Spirit Religion, ritual and performing objects and uh, she got a Fulbright um, and she is on to go to Japan and research if I understand right the work of puppetry and the connection to ritual and a sense of a, um, of a, but a place in its in its uh, history of, of the country so we can't wait to to hear about it. I think it's going to be at the end of the year so um, first of you all welcome and um, Paulette how has it been the last year? How was it? Uh, what's going on in Atlanta? Um, well, first, I need to uh, make a, a small correction. Yes. Um, we are aware of the impact that the shelter in place and the coronavirus plague have had on arts institutions such as museums and theaters. And because of the financial hardship, the Center for Puppetry Arts was not actually able to raise enough money to put on the exhibit this uh, this at the present moment, but we hope that that may become a reality uh, down the road. Oh, that's very sad. So the Black Puppetry Exhibition is a real is a victim also of Corona time. Is a really that's unfortunate, especially yes. for the time we live in. Mm -hmm. That's a really really unfortunate that no mm -hmm. sponsor was there. So so how was that year for you? Um. Well, it's actually been ironically a very productive year for me. Um, I sort of put my head down during the shelter in place and read a very tall stack of books on African American theater history because I was looking for object performance in African American theater history. And then I was asked to speak about that topic in the Ballard Institute's puppetry forum series in the early June, just a few days after the murder of George Floyd. 
Um, and since then, um, I have felt a really strong commitment to research that I never had before because the work that I'm doing feels relevant for the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm looking particularly at object performance as a strategy of resistance to the objectification of Black bodies. Hmm. No, that's, that is said. About how many, how much money is it all about? What's missing? If maybe someone is listening, uh, to, <laughs> who should they contact? You or? Uh, I would direct them to contact um, Beth Shavo, who is mm -hmm. the executive director of the Center for Puppetry Arts. In? Atlanta. In Atlanta itself. So really, this yes. is important, um, an important um, an exhibition and important research. And it's quite uh, devastating next to everything that happened that also that exhibition um, that was already planned, I guess, you know, a year ago or two, um, it did not did not uh, materialize. <laughs> and uh, Manuel, tell us a bit about uh, uh, about you and your experience of the last year. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here again. Um, it's been a tough year. It's been a, a very tough year. I'm a practitioner. I run a theater company, as you know, everybody heard in the in, with my bio. And uh, the theater basically has been closed for a year and a half. And even though you know they say in April that we can open thirty percent, you know, it, it wasn't really cost effective to open the theater. Um, especially small theaters. I have a I have a black box black box theater in Manhattan uh, for a hundred and fifty people. You know, so thirty percent. Sometimes I will get even more people on stage and backstage than on the audience. You know, uh, so I feel that you know we decided to move the reopening of the theater for later on in in August, uh, where we are producing this major uh, festival that is called the International Puppet Fringe Festival. It's the second edition. Um, it's been puppet, tough. It's a, just slow down. It's a top. It's called the Puppet Fringe Festival. festival. I never heard of a of a fringe festival for puppets. Is that a, yes, the it's, first? It's the first one. We had our first first edition in in 2018. It was very successful. Um, then we plan it. It was it's a biennial festival, so we plan it for 2020. But as you know everything was canceled so this year we decided that we were going to do it and to re-invite everyone who apply and all that um and we decided to do a hybrid festival which is going to be half um a virtual and half presential um so it's going to be from august 11 to the 31st the presential part is going to be at the lower east side in our in our theater at the Clement. Where is it located? Your theater it's exactly. On, it's on the lower east side, um, on the the lower east side of barrio. Uh, it's <laughs> uh, on, on Suffolk Street between Delancey and Rivington. It's mm. at the center uh, called the Clemente, which is a Puerto oh, Rican so you know, cultural center that we have four theaters, uh, three galleries, um, and also is the home of of more than sixty artists. Uh, multicultural, you know, artists from many, not only Latinos and Puerto Ricans, but from all over uh, the world. It's a wonderful place. Uh, and the festival is a perfect place for the festival. So what we decided to do this year is that we're going to have the international component uh, being online because many of these companies obviously cannot uh, uh, travel. And we have curated and put together an amazing festival for, um, it's going to be like the, our real comeback to the theater. Um, uh, with more than 40 events uh, during the first week of the festival. And, uh, but I, going back to the coronavirus and, you know, and, the, and, the, and the pandemic, I, I, I wanted to mention that uh, our company uh, was hit pretty hard. We lost actors and puppeteers in our company. Um, so actors yeah. lost their lives? Yes. And also we lost... Um, families, uh, family members as well. Um, it was, it has been very devastating to say the least, um, uh, very sad. Um, also in the Latino theater movement of the city, also other companies were hit um, uh, with the same. It, so uh, the minority communities, as you know, you know, were hit very bad uh, with coronavirus, especially the Lower East Side, which is our immediate community. community. So um, it, it's been, you know, not only 
dealing with the fact that, you know, financially has been devastating, uh, trying to maintain uh, a, a theater um, that is not operating. You know, we lost 90% of our contracts. We cannot, we didn't do performances um, that generated uh, money for the theater. But on the, at the same time, you know, I had to make decisions with the staff, you know, some people lost their jobs because we couldn't, you know, we had to keep paying rent, we had to keep paying, paying utilities, you have to keep paying you know, insurance. So it's, it's really uh, a tough time. And even though we have applied and to many of the relief funds and the loans and all that, uh, it's still not enough uh, when you lose 90% of your contracts, when you're operating with 40% of your staff. Uh, it's it's being uh, challenging, and on top of that, all the emotional um, mm -hmm. uh, burden that the pandemic have put on on all of us. Um, I mean, we have I have been even having workshops with my staff, my immediate staff staff de dealing with you know uh, depression and you know and a, a lot of things uh, that are that are difficult and, and that we need to to deal with now. Finally, like. Three weeks ago, we got back to rehearse, uh, and it was a very emotional moment for everybody to be outdoors rehearsing. We rehearsed the whole production outdoors for three weeks, uh, and, and everybody with their mask. And even though the majority of the people uh, have been vaccinated, we still, you know, having we have to continue with all the restrictions and all that, uh, taking care of everybody. And 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 it's been it was very emotional that first day. Everybody was like crying and even myself I when I talked to my cast for the first time <laughs> a year and a half uh, it was uh, it, it was a happy moment but at the same time a, a, a very I mean a, a, a sad moment at the same time that we have not seen each other mm -hmm. uh, a, for a year and a half and but I have great news we actually went back uh, to the streets uh, we did first of all we did a lot of things online um uh, before before I was talking you were talking about like you know you have good lighting and everything you know we're experts already with <laughs> because we have been operating with zoom you know all the time so i would say that we have done more than 200 uh, programs uh, uh, during this uh, this pandemic we opened a, a, a youtube channel that is called sea kids network if you can check it out, please, it's SEA Kids Network, and please subscribe. Uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, great things for the kids in Spanish and English and for the community. And uh, But then we decided to go back to the streets. We went to the origins of, you know, of theater, too, you know. So uh, last Friday, we premiered a new show that was conceived by me and written and and not only that i made the puppets which i have not done puppets <laughs> in 30 years uh, uh you know i it was kind of like therapeutic during the time of you know of, of the, uh, the the pandemic i started you know taking some online courses and uh, and and start working with new materials i learned about this material called warbler which i have never worked with with and I created uh, many puppets, and those are the puppets that premiered last Friday. Uh, and now we're, we're doing a tour, a city tour, a street tour of mm -hmm. uh, New York uh, for the whole summer. What's the play about? A very it's called Los, Los Grises, the gray ones. And it's a homage to all the elderly people that we have lost. So it's mm -hmm. eight vignettes with eight puppets. Uh, they're all painted and dressed in gray. Uh, that's why it's called, you know, the gray ones. And, and also it's because of many different things. It's a great period, mm. and, you know, the, uh, the age, everything, you know, so it's eight, so it's eight, eight seniors. Uh, and, uh, and the, you know, we have eight vignettes related to their common life, you know, prior to the mm. pandemic. And then what happened yeah. after. So it's one of the first uh, things that, that came out and was shown. Paulette, to come back to you before we come to Gloria. How is the feeling? How is the mood in Atlanta um, during the year? Puppet work, uh, you know, uh, Manuel um, did say, you know, that so many community members, you know, were lost in his. Uh, mm -hmm field how, how is it how is it there um i think that um our guild the atlanta puppetry guild kind of rallied during the pandemic we have had um we usually have a difficult time scheduling meetings 
because everyone is busy and off in this and that in the other direction, but uh, people were really feeling the need to see each other. And so we had several Zoom meetings throughout the year that were very uplifting. We've had some excellent speakers. We had Leslie Carrera Rudolph at the last one. And while things were looking bleak at the beginning of the pandemic, because of course everyone lost all of their bookings, um, people have very resourceful and they found other ways to, um, to perform. Um, and like Manuel, a lot of people, um, you know, immerse themselves in making new puppets um, or writing new shows. And so um, I think people are kind of ready to tentatively move forward. <laughs> yes. Mm. Did you research in the time, you know, about the black puppetry? I don't know enough about it. Maybe okay. you share a little bit. What did you discover anyway in how, that you said it took on a new meaning and uh, urgency? Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Um, when we did the Living Objects African American Puppetry Exhibit, we were trying to fill a hole in knowledge of American puppetry in general. And the first thing we did was, oh, let's see if we can find connections between African object performance and African American um, puppetry. And we dig and we dig and we dig and we could not substantiate that in the material culture record. And that is because slaveholders outlawed the creation of figurative objects that represented an African worldview. Um, so the kinds of masks and articulated figures that Africans were performing with, uh, people would have been severely punished if they tried to create that um, while they were enslaved. The other reason that we couldn't find direct connections is that um, puppetry is a community building practice in traditional African society. And um, slavery was a complete destruction of all social institutions. So, and then not only were they destroyed because people were removed from their societies, but also when they arrived in the new world, the last thing that the slaveholders wanted was for them to rebuild social networks because you use those to organize revolts. So um, with the exception of places in the Caribbean where syncretism with the Catholic church enabled people to use, you know, the public rituals of the Catholic um, calendar to participate in object performance trend, uh, traditions, uh, there, there wasn't a direct connection through the material culture. Um, but as I researched, you know, when I had my head down in that big pile of books <laughs> during the shelter in place, I started to see that there were connections uh, in the storytelling performance complex. Some of the stories survived the Middle Passage because they were in people's heads. Um, and also in the whole um, just performance context, when, where, how, the way that you speak, the way that you move, um, the, the music, those elements did survive. Um, and I could then start tracing the material culture practice, not through things that we would call theater, but through spirituality. And so I'm currently digging deeper into traditions such as Santeria and Vodun and Candomblé um, and the kinds of private altars that people kept in their houses or their yards um, that the larger society wasn't always aware of what the meaning was. But those are places where I'm starting to find connections between the object performance of African Americans and Africans in the material culture. I hope that mm -hmm. answers some of your questions. No, no, no. It's, this is important, <laughs> and we all do not uh, do not know enough. That's why this exhibition is, I think, so important. Claudia, thanks, thanks um, for waiting. Um, you have one of the foremost researchers, if not the foremost researcher in the world on puppetry, the world on puppetry, con contemporary. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, theory and practice. Um, 
and you have so many global collections. Tell us uh, what has that year meant to puppeteers, to the art form itself, the year of Corona, and where are we now? Yeah. Um, thank you for that. I, I, I guess I should say that I, there's a lot of really fabulous researchers out there, and some of them are sitting here with me today um, in the world of puppetry. And actually, that's what I find kind of exciting is that it's a growing field, and there's just, you know, this kind of opened up in a way that um, there are uh, partly has to do with new scholarship on material culture and materiality, um, object oriented ontologies, these kinds of critical discussions that have become kind of popular in. Um, so many disciplines are bringing people to different perspectives on puppetry or things very close to related to and integral to puppetry like um, what Paulette has just been describing. Um, I think in terms of the, the year um, in, in relationship to puppetry in um, this COVID year, um, at the very beginning, what there was a real sense, I mean, obviously the disappointment um, and the, you know, just sort of grief, I think, of everybody um, who had lost, you know, their, <laughs> their art for so long. Um, so there's been this, this mix and a kind of journey, I think, um, I guess I do, uh, I, I would say that, you know, Paulette and Manuel are all part of UNIMA, this international organization of, of puppetry arts, uh, which um, is really important. Um, and we we also work with UNIMA USA, the um, USA branch of that. And there's also a group called Puppeteers of America. And all these organizations really came together to raise money for puppeteers, to you know find ways of supporting them, helping them transition to doing online kinds of work, to have support groups. Um, and although I'm not a performer, I was really um, inspired to be part of that. And um, it, you just felt like this really big community trying to find ways to come together. And sometimes like there were even sessions, uh, the UNIMA organized a big online session for people like myself who teach. Um, and uh, I in fact taught a puppetry class at Hunter um, in the fall online, you know, and um, it was a real discussion of, um, I don't want to say completely, but you found a lot of older puppeteers who have, you know, much more, it was much more difficult for them to, to, to um, transition to online things, really um, feeling very uh, dejected about the whole situation. And then other people, and they tended to be more younger puppeteers, but not always, you know, saying, you know, well, there are these other opportunities. Let's find where the opportunities are, how, you know, what we can explore while we have this moment um, and exploring new kinds of animation and um, things online. And people talking about the fact that, you know, um, puppetry, because it can, you know, use this idea of animation and um, different kinds of scale, or uh, that it can be two dimensional and still be interesting, um, had a kind of advantage over some forms of acting that were going on, you know, online on Zoom. And so there was a lot of um, exploration um, and kind of things that had happened before more locally, uh, like puppet slams or um, puppet cabarets, where lots of people just give short performances. Um, there were international ones, um, and I think the first toy, the the first one that happened was um, Great Small Works organized this online toy theater festival, and I remember what I remember about it was you know people are writing in the chat and everybody was just like you know so <laughs> excited to feel like we were together in that moment and seeing everybody's work and all this and just you know that again that that sense it really underlined for me the way in which puppetry is also so much about creating a community of people who are um, invested in this uh, work. And um, I always say that like people in puppetry are like the most wonderful people I've ever met. You know? <laughs> Maybe it has to do with being able to like, you know, give yourself over to something else in performance, you know, give yourself over to an object or another character, but this sort of outpouring of, um, of support. Um, and then a lot of investigation um, into social justice issues. And I think, you know, every organization that I know, um, you know, giving online um, uh, panels and talks and discussions, uh, really supporting puppeteers of color and offering more opportunities and ways to, you know, to, to support them and make, um, make uh, puppetry feel, you know, hopefully be more inclusive um, and diverse. Uh, I mean, it is diverse, but, you know, to uh, feel that way and feel supportive to, to people in the art um, from all different kinds of backgrounds, especially here in the US. Um, one thing that has been happening, there's something UNIMA 
does called the World Encyclopedia of Puppetry Arts, which was a, a book that originally that was started years ago and it took like Unima 20 years to put it together. And by the time it came out, it was huge and already like out of date because it took them 20 years to, to put it together. So um, Karen Smith, a uh, wonderful member of Unima USA, who's now the new president of Unima, uh, she um, was put in charge of putting it all online and updating it. So that's been a kind of ongoing process. And, you know, really the Black Lives Matter movement and all of this discussion has kind of um, jump started this sense of, you know, we need to look at what, what, what the USA entries are there and really make representation of the wonderful puppeteers of color who have been involved in the art for a long time, like but where are, where are they? <laughs> Why are they not there? And um, so that's really something uh, important that's being uh, worked on in, in a sort of scholarly way. Hmm. Well, that's a, quite an update. I sense uh, some, some optimism and some, you know, kind of <clears throat> national and global um, um, connection, you know, that's, so you have a tight network uh, in a way, and that's uh, proved to be important this time. So uh, my question to Manuel and Paulette, did, did something change? Also, do you feel there is a change happening, something in the field, the attention uh, that what Claudia talked about, the kind of socially engaged art and paying more attention um, to, to, to Hubei? Do you both think that took place? Um, I, I think that, you know, People are starting to get aware, uh, you know, awareness about this issue. Um, it's been, I've been in this field for a while, and I have, uh, as as loud as I am and as active as I am, I have felt like I'm, I was invisible for, you know, for for many many years. Uh, even though I was in the leadership, I was the president of Unima USA, I was the pres the vice president of Unima International. Still, you know, it was like very, uh, it was like them and the little one of, of us here trying to say hello i'm here you know remember the like the puppeteers of color or the, the you know and and this new you know social justice um it's not new it's been you know but at least it finally it took like the the, the, the protagonist role in media and all that have really made aware uh, of many people in the field that hey you know we've been here for a long time we need to be recognized, we need to be included in, you know, in, in, in the research, we need to be, you know, history is important. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, we start, you know, I've been talking about Pura del Pre, the first Puerto Rican uh, librarian in the United States and the, the, the first recorded Puerto, Afro Puerto Rican in, you know, uh, in puppetry in, in the United States from the 1920s, 1930s. Her work is unbelievable. And finally, some people are paying attention and including her name um, in, in, in some stuff. So it's, yes, it's, it's changing, but we have a long way to go. And I feel that now people, you know, it's trendy. So let's talk about social justice. Is that, you know, the whole thing about, um, a, you know, the, the new administration, which I applaud, you know, that they are putting this into the, the, the front page. But uh, one thing is to say it, the other thing is to really be inclusive. The other thing is to be, to be really fair, to bring equity to the whole um, uh, situation. I could tell you tons of stories um, tell uh, one. throughout my career. Say, oh, tell us a story. From, from, you know, from uh, people, producers or, you know, <clears throat> shows that have been very successful of my shows and everything to tell me, uh, my audience is too American for this or, uh, a, or like that, too American or, or, <laughs> or you know, like, I mean, what does that mean? I'm American, you know, so uh, like, so uh, I can tell you many, many different stories uh, that I don't want to go into this right now. But I mean, it's like as a person of color, as an artist of color, as, a, as an activist, because I believe that my theater and the work that I do and my writings and everything is very political. It has been to bring some kind of uh, visibility to, to, to my people and to our, you know, to, not, you know to, to the Latino culture in my case, you know, uh, who has been here forever, you know? Uh, and uh, it's very political, the work I do, even the work I do for children. I mean, cultural preservation, that's a political action. And that's mm -hmm. basically one of the things that I'm doing. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I, I feel that there's a long way to go, but finally, um, 
you know, we hopefully we're going to stop being the poster child or the poster boy or the token boy or the Latino, you know, it's been like that for many years. And it's been like that because I've been like, hey, I'm here <laughs> or going like this, you know, doing so much in order for people to, to you know, to have a space. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry if I sound a little, you know, there's a lot of frustration. No, no, that's important. I, we would like to hear that. Actually, I would like to hear those stories, you know, what you, what you experienced, you know, if we, we have the time. But um, how, do you, how do you feel the moment? Um, well, I feel like I came into puppetry at just the right time. And I want to thank Manuel for being there, uh, leading the charge, because I started in 2015. I went to the Puppeteers of America Festival for the first time in 2015, and I got to see Manuel perform his Pinocchio, which is um, it's set on the Mexican border, and it uses the story to talk about all the immigration issues that we're still struggling wow. with today. Um, and I was so blown away. I went back to my dorm room. And out of like plastic bottles and, and plastic bags, I made a little necklace. This is also a recycled, um, this is paper bags and plastic bags braided together, but I made a little necklace and I presented it to him just because I appreciated his work so much. So he's been there in the vanguard all this time. So when I walk into puppetry, people were ready to receive me, uplift me, support me, um, John Bell, you know, he has been such a phenomenal mentor. Um, and I therefore like to focus on the successes and the tradition of openness that there has been in our puppetry organizations from the beginning. So I did a little homework before this talk and I looked up um, Joseph Skupa and Jan Malik, uh, who during the Nazi occupation um, in what is the present is in present day Czech Republic, they were using their puppet shows to critique the regime and to give their audience hope. And Scuba ended up being arrested in 1944. But um, that shows how well puppetry lends itself to this kind of social justice activism. Um, Scupa was also elected president of UNIMA in 1933, and his career exemplifies the organization's mission of fostering international friendship through the art of puppetry. Um, here again, I appreciate um, Manuel's leadership. I took the opportunity to attend the recent UNIMA World Congress, um, which would have been in Bali last year, and I had no hope of getting raising the money to travel that far, but uh, it was online. And uh, Manuel did an excellent job of sort of herding all the cats who were new to the online format and managing the voting and everything. I was not a voting counselor, so I just got to sit back and observe. But one of the benefits of doing it in that format is that for the first time, a large number of delegates from Latin America and Africa were able to attend and make their voices heard. Um, and so, in fact, they raised the proposal and we all voted to um, make the conference accessible virtually in the future so that those who cannot travel physically can still participate. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about P of A's work in um, what we're calling equity, diversity, and inclusion because these conversations were arising in the organization uh, before 2020. Um, and in 2019, uh, at the National Festival, which happened to be in Minneapolis that year, uh, they brought in an outside consultant to conduct a conversation with anybody, any member who wanted to attend about equity, diversity, and inclusion issues. And then from that conversation, the organization, um, you know, began to uh, formulate some plans for addressing those issues. So they created a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, commission, which I'm part of. And then because I was elected to the board of UNIMA USA in 2020, 
now I am UNAMA's liaison to the EDI committee. So P of A and UNAMA work on that together. We've done a number of programs this past year, um, including a panel that Edna Bland and I did at the um, joint World Puppetry Day celebration. Um, and so, like I said, thanks mm -hmm. to people like Manuel, I walked into puppetry at just the right moment so that um, the organizations were already moving in this direction. And unlike maybe some other arts organizations I know of that have just kind of jumped on the bandwagon because of the incidents of the past year, these questions were already on the table in P of A. Yeah. So that's great. The puppeteers were, you know, in a way ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, Claudia, um, worldwide, it seems puppetry is gaining attention uh, by theater makers, um, you know, whether it's avant-garde or, um, or the established uh, classical, you know, uh, theater world. Um, why? Why do you think? Oh, well, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I mean, I think, um... You know, we're, I mean, a couple of reasons. One of them is that I think we're living right now in such a time of visual culture, you know, that we're so visually inundated. My, my sister, I always mention, I can mention her today, she's a head of drawings and prints at the Metropolitan, uh, but her, her field is 17th century Dutch prints. And one of the things I always admire is that she's able to look at a print and she can sort of say where this artist went and what they saw because there were so few images around. Like if you went to Rome and you saw, you know, some gorgeous sculpture by, you know, one of the famous artists at the time, you know, you would sketch it and then those kind of forms would, you know, end up in your, in your imagery. Um, but we are just like inundated with imagery all the time and with video and um, internet and computers. And so I feel like one reason that puppetry is really uh, becoming an art that's like in so many different forms of performance is because when people go to the theater now, like they sort of are so uh, conditioned by all this other, you know, animated, you know, things that we, we want to see, you know, something that's, you know, that's our expectation and, and so much about art, you know, our art world in general. Um, so I think that's a really strong reason. I think our uh, international exposure to cultures around the world where puppetry has maybe had a more central um, uh, place. Uh, and other kinds of forms of performance that are, you know, have masks and objects or very stylized performance, I think attunes us to that. Um, and I also think, you know, we're at a moment of, well, there's, there's also this, you know, uh, uh, explosion of things and, you know, robotics and things like that, other ways of thinking about or cyber, you know, characters <laughs> thinking about our bodies and, you know, um, created bodies and, you know, what that means. So I think it's a, it's a place that people are investigating. They're using puppetry or uh, in some ways to investigate what it means to be human right now. Um, and also, I would say, finally, our relationship to the natural world, because we're creating so many, you know, built constructed things, you know, that are piling up on our everywhere in all of our natural environment. And so we have to deal with these things. So we're so um, used to dealing with things and objects all the time. Um, and our, you know, cell phones and things are objects that we kind of carry around with us that sort of like become part of us, you know, and mm -hmm. part of our extra brains we carry. And, um, you know, so we're so inundated in a world that is, you um, resonant with ideas of puppetry. But I guess I also want to say that there have been other moments, historical moments like the turn of the 19th, 20th century, where artists have been very interested in puppetry and the culture has. But I think the underlying cultural issues and ideas that were being wrestled with and discussed were different, you know, and, and puppets because of their place to be, you know, sort of akin to humans, but also reflecting technology, having materiality, you know, they, they form a nexus of um, ideas of, or a nexus of materials and associations that you can use to explore ideas, dif you know, different sets of ideas. So I think our cultural moment is interested in puppets for a different reason, uh, but it's because puppetry, you know, can offer all of these different things. But, but I actually want to, can I add something? Because, yes. um, you know, when uh, Paulette was talking before about looking into um, uh, 
you know, ritual objects and um, use of puppets in that. One of the, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that I'm co-editing with Tim Cusack, this uh, two volume uh, set of anthologies <laughs> um, on, uh, it's called Puppet and Spirit, Ritual, Religion and Performing Objects. And Paulette has something in there. And uh, we are just starting to get these essays in. And it's really exciting. I mean, some of the essays are, you know, about traditional forms that have a long history of using uh, puppets and object, performing objects as a way of um, negotiating with the divine uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, but also what we're finding, and I think it's also part of my inspiration for um, wanting to do this book to begin with is especially academics wanting a way to talk about and a place to talk about something like, uh, you know, a spiritual experience in the theater or with objects or um, other kinds of uncanniness. And, you know, what is a good theoretical way to, to do that? Um, and it's a whole part of puppetry that has always been a part of puppetry, but I also feel hasn't been given enough attention. And yet when you start to talk to puppeteers, they get really excited because you know, they're dealing with their, their characters that feel like living objects and that there's a spirit there. And there's all this world of association and reference and experience um, that we're trying to give some articulation to and make, make that, you know, an under, like that's also, uh, it, it's not just something that they do in a particular tradition somewhere, you know, uh, far away, uh, um, but it's something that really imbues the art in so many different ways. And we've got like both, you know, we're talking about traditional forms, contemporary forms. So I, um, I just also think that in terms of like why we might be interested in puppetry, that this is also something uh, that needs to be discussed. And especially I, at a time when there's really a lot of religious conflict in the world right now. <laughs> and uh, so this is maybe another way of thinking through that. Mm. Yeah, wow, that's, uh, that's quite a, a big concept to, to, to think, think through it. And uh, I think we mentioned earlier, Heinrich von Kleist who wrote this essay on the marionette theater. And he said, perhaps puppetry would, is a way, a back door to get back into that garden of Eden, that state of mm -hmm. innocence, that paradise for that moment while you look at it and uh, you experience something, you know, in that sense of divine and uh, as you said. So, but um, Emmanuel, we start with you. Why puppetry? We read your bio, you did so much. Why do you believe through puppets you can express the world or give meaning to for you or others? I actually think that the objects, the animated objects, uh, are magical or create this kind of relationship uh, with the audience. Um, I mean, uh, my work mostly is for, for young audiences, uh, but also I do puppetry for, for adults, for seniors, for goodness sake, the seniors, they react to the puppets they, in an amazing, amazing way. And they, there's kind of like a connection. And I believe it's because it breaks down barriers. Uh, like uh, there's, you know, people could, the puppet, it's what it is, you know, a special thing uh, that, that, that we breathe life to it. And then the audience or the, you know, the, the connects with that. And it's kind of like, you know, breaking because it feels that there's a, like a new reality that they are living. I mean, this is my own theory based on <laughs> being a practitioner for so many years uh, that, that I just see and it was actually my own experience. I always tell this that, you know, my first contact with puppetry, with live puppetry, was when I was in third grade back in Vega Baja, Puerto Rico, my hometown, in my schoolyard, when a troupe like mine came to perform a show that included puppets, actors, live musicians. It was a beautiful set and everything. I remember vividly because it was what really changed my life. It gave a purpose to my life. Um, uh, and I, that was very, I mean, I was like mesmerized uh, and it was kind of like this personal uh, relationship with that I had with what was happening on stage and what those objects that would be, were being animated. Um, so that passion or that, or what changed in me at that moment that I knew exactly at when I was in third grade, what I wanted to do, 
Um, and I told my mom, you know, and she, thank God I have a wonderful mom that helped me <laughs> by making puppets and, you know, encouraging me and, and you know, and all that. Um, it, but that, that moment, I still feel it and treasure it. And I am hoping and I believe that I've been pro provoking the same thing in many, many people, not only in kids, but also in adults. And I believe it's because the puppet being one of the major elements uh, in that. And I'm a theater person. I do, you know, like uh, theater without puppets, uh, you know, musicals, everything, you know. But as, as a creator, I always like to include the object because I believe the experience is more complete. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know if I'm making sense, but I feel no, yeah. that, that, uh, that theme that provokes the puppetry between the audience and the object, it's, it's something that you cannot achieve um, uh, with just an actor. I believe that. I mean, uh, that's my own theory. <laughs> Anyway, that's that's what I think mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to achieve every day, and actually, that's basically what I what my company is called. Uh, Sea, Sea is a Spanish verb. It means it's an invitation to be. I I want to you know to provoke change in society. Uh, I, I want to in, you know empower kids. I want them to in, I want to invite them to be whatever they want to be. You know. And, and so even from the name of the company reflects the mission of what I'm trying to do with my puppets, with my singing, with my acting, with my writing. And so, uh, yes, I think puppetry, that's why it's so important for the work that I do. <laughs> Thank you. Paulette, what, what comes to your mind? Oh boy, okay. Um, since Claudia opened the door, I'm gonna walk through. And I'm going to say that for me, puppetry is a healing art. Um, and that particularly as with a spiritual power. So as I was saying, this thread about puppetry and social justice was bubbling up before the events of this past year. Um, even before we began planning the Living Objects exhibit, um, there were African-American artists using puppetry to draw attention to violence against black bodies. So Tarish Pipkins had developed a show called Just Another Lynching and Nefri Ameni had done a piece called Food for the Gods. Um, and the image of one of the masks from that show became the image on most of the promotional materials for the Living Objects exhibit. So, I had been engaged to co-curate the show with Dr. John Bell. And when um, they made the decision to put that image on the promotional materials, I understood what I was doing in a completely different way because um, our conception of violence against black bodies in the present moment has mostly to do with police violence against black bodies. But um, my own experience connects with something that is not frequently addressed, which is the rate of missing persons in the black community. We are 13% of the US population and I think around 30% of the reported missing persons. A lot of our people who go missing also are not reported missing because our communities have difficult relationships with the police. And so they don't want to talk to the police when something like this happens. Uh, children that I played with as a child went missing. Um, I grew up in, not in Atlanta, but Atlanta is another site of a deep tragedy of missing children. And so for me, when this mask showed up on the promotional materials for the Living Objects exhibit, um, it was, I'm like, okay, this whole show is then, I can make this a devotion for all of those missing bodies. And the puppets in that gallery space for me became effigies. Um, because when people go missing, then there's no closure. You don't have a funeral. You can't celebrate their life because you don't know whether they're dead 
or not yet. But when we did the show and we had the festival in conjunction with the show, there was singing, there was dancing, there was storytelling. Um, and for me, that laid to rest a whole group of sort of wandering souls. And I, I meant that not just at the level of the children that I knew, but at the level of all across the country, all across African American experience in this country, um, it was a way of laying those spirits to rest. So yes, puppetry for me is a it's a spiritual healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very powerful statement. Just yesterday we had. Uh, Sasapin Siribanij from, uh, uh, from Thailand, from Bangkok. And she said her motivation to have created BIPAM, uh, an organization of 10, 11 countries from the Southeast Asia region was, uh, you know, of the missing people, missing bodies, you know, also mm -hmm. that, uh, um, so there, there is a theme here. And she also talked about, you know, the, the objects and also, and puppet, puppet theater. Could you all give us a bit some information we do not know enough about the puppetry book, but who do you look up to? What are theater artists, puppet artists mm -hmm. that have influenced you? Maybe about shows or scenes, how they how something connects. So can you tell us, um, you know, what are your points of references? Well, I guess I go first. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Well, like I mentioned the work of Pura Belpre, um, uh, which, you know, it's really even being from Puerto Rico and, and born and raised in Puerto Rico, I didn't know about Pura Belpre until I moved to New York to come to school here, um, which is another big thing that, you know, how can we do not know our, about our own people? Um, so I was performing at a school uh, in the city and a teacher, and uh, told me, oh, you are the new Pura Belpre. <laughs> and that's how I, I said, the new Pura Belpre, who was Pura Belpre? And then if you don't know, please look, Google it right now. Uh, this amazing Afro-Latina uh, uh, pioneer, she's actually part of my documentary. I have a three piece, uh, a three episode documentary called uh, Puppetry in the Hispanic Caribbean. And um, her story is fantastic. And, and at the same time, you know, when I started learning about her, I mean, there's a national award for uh, a children's publication in the United States called Pura Belpre. I mean, there's a lot of things. So her work uh, doing puppet storytelling with puppetry, uh, it's really uh, one of my, you know, I started researching her and, and, and I think it's one of my inspirations, especially for the work that I do here in New York. Um, another big inspiration, and of course, I'm, I'm a scholar, and my dissertation was about, uh, about him, is Leopoldo Santiago Lavandero, which was like the father of theater education in Puerto Rico. He was the founder of the Department of Dramas in the University of Puerto Rico. He was the founder of the theater program and, and the, uh, the arts program in the school system in Puerto Rico. And he was actually, uh, uh, he taught at, at Yale University, um, a, a, you know, last century, the, you know, and in the theater school, he was a, 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 and then he went back to Puerto Rico. It's a Puerto Rican a pioneer as well. He was the te a teacher of Paul Newman. I mean, things like that, that people do not know. Uh, it, it, so it, the work that he did, and I had the pleasure, uh, like he was on 90 something, he was suffering already from Alzheimer, but I was able to uh, interview um, uh, when I was in my 20s and I have that you know and that was a special moment because I was able to you know hear from him you know uh, here and there when he would remember things and, and meet this amazing man uh, and he definitely has been my inspiration my work if you see the work that I do is based on the work that he did uh, at large scale in in you know, obviously in the in the schools and in, in, in the educational system in Puerto Rico. Um, uh, puppeteers, you know, I would say, obviously, uh, you know, the, the great Jim Henson uh, was uh, also a, a very big inspiration for, for me um, because as a kid, the only uh, 
puppetry that I would see in television, you know, uh, was, was basically uh, the Muppets and, you know, uh, Sesame Street, even the Spanish version, Plaza Sesame, all that. So I think that was very uh, inspiring. And of course, all the, the, the pioneers in, of the Puerto Rican uh, puppetry movement in Puerto Rico, they also uh, had a big influence in me. And it's all that part of my uh, documentary as well. Yes, that's my inspiration. <laughs> Colette? Okay, um, well, I will follow Manuel and say that Jim Henson is one of my biggest inspirations. Um, I have been a docent in the Worlds of Puppetry Museum at the Center for Puppetry Arts since it opened the new wing in 2015. Um, the museum has a global gallery and a Henson gallery. And I always start the tour in the Henson gallery by asking people if they know when and where Jim Henson was born. And then I raise the question of how coming from Mississippi in the 1930s, he developed a career that emphasized tolerance for all kinds of people everything that he did was about that. And so I have deepest admiration for him. Hmm. Um, Claudia, what companies, what artists do you follow also globally who are, uh, you know, yeah. uh, you wrote this great book uh, with many I mean, others of with your colleagues, of course, but um, who, who are yeah. artists? Uh, I, I'm looking at, um, like maybe I should also say a little bit how I, I came to puppetry, you know, because it's um, I, I yeah. guess it's, you know, I, I loved, you know, uh, puppets growing up and all. But I think what really inspired me I was um, uh, I did a lot of street theater when I was a kid. I did street theater with the theater for the new city downtown in New York. I was one of the few kids performing. There were a lot of masks and, you know, very <laughs> stylized theater. Um, I wrote my dissertation, um, which got published as a book on the San Francisco mime troupe that used not only stylized theater, but they also had a whole political puppetry uh, wing of their, their political performance using kind of a, a radical punch puppet, you know, who went around uh, telling you how you could, you know, not have to pay the parking meters and things like that. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, and I also have always been writing about Asian theater and Asian theater has a lot of puppetry in it. So I've been inspired by all of those. Uh, but I think what really got me kind of plunged into the world of puppetry were the Henson festivals that went on down um, in downtown New York uh, in the late, uh, in the early 2000s. And they were really puppetry from all over the world. So companies like Handspring Puppet Company, um, who you've interviewed, um, puppet, there were some Czech companies and doing work that was um, uh, not for uh, children uh, necessarily. There were some children companies, but you know, seeing what I just thought was the most inspiring theater to me at the time, um, uh, a company from, I guess, Argentina, El Periférico de Objetos, if I say that right, um, you know, and things that made me stop and question, uh, like, how am I watching this? Or as I say, how am I being asked to watch this? And that were showing things, um, you know, that tools that I had for scholarly analysis were not you know, applying here, you know, you could have gorgeous language, but it didn't fit with the puppet and, you know, puppets were doing things that were interesting in their own right. And I was really trying to search for, you know, ways to talk about this. So I think the, the puppetry that really inspires me, and I think there, I see it in a lot of companies. Um, you know, Manuel Cinema, of course, is wonderful. Tori Bend is an artist I like a lot, um, are people who are in the work they're doing also exploring the form and showing how materiality can be expressive on stage in uh, different ways and where the surprises are uh, and the plots are also expressing something about puppetry and material performance. So actually in that other book I'm writing, hopefully uh, <laughs> on the essays on puppetry, I'm trying to sort of offer things that I've been thinking about for a while, seeing over a large range of puppetry um, uh, even a, a puppeteer like Hank Borwinkle, Dutch puppeteer, uh, who used to perform a, a lot. Um, there's a wonderful moment in us. He's a fabulous puppet work. Um, he's not uh, performing anymore. I think his son is. Uh, but of this, um, uh, these small vignettes that are accompanied by music um, and very visual and surreal uh, and poetic. 
And um, in this one, there's like a, a big head and it's the top of the head opens up and there's a little puppet that comes out of the head and it starts to churn his brain and it takes off the bandage around the head and wraps it on this pole. And then there's this moment where we just watch the bandage unravel off the pole. And to me, like that's so expressive. It's not uh, what we think of when we think of a puppet, um, but it's in a world of puppetry where we're understanding that material can be alive and express something on stage. And so we're watching it differently. So I guess rather than, so there, I, I think there are a lot of puppeteers exploring this, uh, these ideas right now. In fact, it's become almost vernacular in the puppetry world. And that's why I feel like it's an exciting uh, world of performance. Um, so there are, there are a lot of companies, but they said a few of them. I, I love Paper Moon <laughs> Puppet Theater. Um, and I think what's so lovely about that company too is the um, great spirit, personal spirit in which she, uh, they do work and create <laughs> unity. So I think that's also a strong part of it. Um, so I don't know if that's that not completely mm. po pointing to a number of like, here's- the No, 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 we have just a little, yeah. But no, Ria, she was here from Paper Moon and she said during Corona, they, people could give $50 or something to and ask the company to create a short puppet play for someone. They would interview the person, talk to create something for the person. A very radical idea, actually, that yeah, you know, she, someone yeah. from the audience is, uh, gives a little bit of money, ask the company not to fulfill their ideas and say, you know, um, I say, who would you like to give this show to? Let's talk, call that person into a nurse or a grandfather. And then they created something. They also did a project where they sent, I think, uh, puppet building material in a box to a home and then give it like instruction how to do it. And then they asked them to do a little story and then they would put up the video. They, by the way, also did a big talk series, a little bit like ours with puppeteers um, from, from around the world. So. Um, we at the Siegel often also do talk about dramaturgy and the importance um, of dramaturgical thinking and the art form of theater performance and puppetry is part of that world and not just the entertainment, but there also, of course, has to be. But is there a kind of a new dramaturgy evolving? Do you guys notice something where you say, you know, um, the, 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 the puppet theater is moving into fields? We had Hotel Modern here. Um, and they did, you know, a show where they had on a, they built a model of a concentration camp with little puppets and tiny cameras moved through the camp and it was projected on a big screen as a very innovative, incredible um, show. Carol Martin introduced us um, um, to them. So um, are, you, are you feeling or even that year now in Corona, are there new things emerging? Uh, do you, are you observing new forms or... Um, new engagements that, is, that are surprising? Well, I think not too surprising, but is certainly happening. I mean, so many puppeteers spent this year exploring uh, digital technology and other kind of technological ways they can create things and um, are, you know, I, I, uh, are interested in integrating that in their work. There was already, I think, a, a, you know, a lot of it happening and I would say you know, for me, like animation is within the world of the, you know, animation and, you know, CGI and those kind of things, you know, they're so related to the world of puppetry that there's an automatic kind of connection. And you saw a lot of puppet shows where there'd be then projections, even Handspring Puppet Company's early work with um, William Kentridge or their projections and animations and like puppets. And so there's this whole sort of landscape. Um, but it will be interesting, I think, I don't, I don't know exactly which direction it's going, but it, it will be interesting to see where that goes in the future now that people have spent so much time. Uh, and I think, you know, a, a lot of, like I say, not, not just on being online, but exploring what can I do with this new tool? Mm -hmm. Manuel, are you seeing things for your festival, for your upcoming yes. that are different? Yes. There's, um, there's obviously the use and the integration of technology is something big that is happening in puppetry. Um, uh, and of course the pandemic and the time you know, being at home have added to that because that's, you know, that's our tool to use it right now. I am actually uh, uh, encouraging people to do that. And also, in a, you know, when I'm curating a festival, I'm, I'm trying to, to find a combination of both. I mean, puppetry is still a, a traditional art form. 
And for me, a preservation of the art form is also very important. The development of it too, and the, you know, like the, the, the evolution of it is important. But I also think that the new generations uh, should be exposed to the wonders of the past as well, you know? So I, I want to create, and this is what's happening also in my own work, a balance in, be, you, know, in the, you know, some shows that I do are very heavy technology, you know, like with projections with, you know, like cameras and all that kind of thing. And amazing, like LED lighting and all that kind of thing. And then other ones, I really want the essence of what it was before or to show people to recreate a period. Um, I, I, I remember just doing, you know, we do some, some of our shows are, uh, Latinized uh, European children's stories. Um, you know, like, so we did a, a little red riding hood, a, hood uh, a Latina little red riding hood, and it was very interesting, integrated actors, puppets and everything, but I wanted to do it in the, in the way that I saw children's theater when I was a, a, a kid with, you know, with the backdrops and the forest, you know, very, very, very classical. And everybody, some people say, Manuel, that's very old style. And I say, yes. And, and that was the that was my uh, purpose as an artist to recreate a very old style, you know, in a new time, you know. So, and I believe, especially being a, a repertory theater company like we are, that we, you know, adding new shows or just bring, you know revamping old shows and all that. I I really as a as a creator try to balance uh, the the new stuff, which is fantastic, and I love it, and, you know. And I'm I'm trying to to learn every day and to include it in my my work but at the same time to preserve and to do things in the traditional way. And I think that uh, the artists should try to find that balance because it's very important because things in, you know, not, not everything new, it's good always, you know, it's like the bad, the old things, you know, are, are not bad either. So it, it has to be a, a balance. And that's what I am um, uh, using when I'm curating or when I'm uh, creating. Okay, yeah. So um, I'm glad that Claudia brought up the word dramaturgy. Uh, I'm still relatively young in puppetry and still figuring out what I want to do. I'm not really a performer yet. Um, but as I said in the beginning, this year has made my research seem more relevant and necessary than ever. And as I've been working on my book about object performance in the Black Atlantic, it seems like as soon as I dig something up, I find myself in a conversation with an artist who's like, I need that. And they take it right away. And I've never felt that in academic research before. So an example, there is a lot of discussion and attempt to deal with the legacy of blackface. Um, and so I had been working with an artist named Garland Farwell, who did several shows in the Henson festivals in years of yore, and he had received a grant to do a documentary on jig dolls. And if you don't know what a jig doll is, um, it's a figure, a jointed figure like this, and then um, it usually stands on a board and you make it dance by tapping the board. Unfortunately, a great many of these um, in the 19th and first half of the 20th century were blackface figures. And so um, Garland was trying to come to terms with that legacy. And yet another part of the dramaturgy um, is how do you construct the figure so that it moves the way that you want it to move? Um, and so I made another set because I'd been researching African um, figures. These are toe puppets. So the string goes around your big toe and then you sit on the ground and manipulate them like this. And I was looking for, um, you know, any evidence that these types of objects might have been created in African American communities. Couldn't find it. But um, this is the kind of exploration that I've been doing and feeding to other artists. As soon, it, it's literally every. It seems like every week I dig something up. I'm in a phone conversation with somebody and they're like, oh, I need that. <laughs> so um, that's been a very interesting time in that way. 
So you said, you know, you're, you're open for articles and for research. Maybe say a little yes. bit, people, how people can contact you. Okay, well, can I put my email address in the chat? Sure. Okay, um, I am currently co-editing an anthology on race, gender, and disability in object performance with Alyssa Mello and Laura Purcell Gates. That volume will be forthcoming from Routledge. Everything's coming from Routledge in 2022. Everything's coming out in 2022, we hope. Um, and we're still taking submissions or proposals for that uh, topic through July 1st. So if anyone out there thinks they have something that would be appropriate, please contact me and I will send you the full call for proposals. Thank you. Good, good. and it's Paulette Richards, number three dot. Mm -hmm. Oh, a Gmail, Gmail, sorry, let me do that again. Yes. A Gmail, yeah. Trying and, to talk and type at the same time didn't yeah, work. Yeah, I'm impressed that you that you got it done. So um, yeah, so this is ongoing research. If you have any suggestions, uh, also for Paulette or anyone, you let us know at the Siegel Center or how Ron can forward it or contact them um, um, directly. So uh, this is important. What we heard, you know, that uh, I think Ronsier, the great philosopher, said, "New work, new uh, breakthroughs uh, come appear on." stages on the world when you have a traditional art form and a new technology exactly what Manuel talked about you know that mm -hmm. there's some a meeting of this and something new will come out and uh, and I think uh, uh, this is, uh, is something we are seeing at the moment and uh, Paulette who says you know let's look at the history let's look at these objects what did they mean at that time and what do they mean now and let's help to change imagination, the great Edouard Glissant, who also taught at the Great mm -hmm. Center said, um, could the problems, the racism, the sexism, homophobia, or hate of the foreigners and refugees, it's a problem of, or a lack of imagination. People cannot imagine, they're not able to. And if there's anything that helps us to imagine different worlds, different uh, possibilities, um, you know, it is actually theater performance and also, yes, through puppets, uh, handspring, Basil John said in South Africa, I said, my puppets could say stuff on a stage and didn't have to go to jail. <laughs> or people accepted it, you know, it was, it was a puppet. It was ridiculous to sue a puppet, <laughs> but it made a change, you know, uh, it changed something, you know, and he said uh, the example of uh, the Trinity, like God, Father, and uh, Holy Spirit, you know, how do you paint it? How do you do it? It looks so odd on these oil paintings. But, you know, you have a puppeteer who moves a puppet and the second puppeteer helps and the puppet looks alive, but they are not alive, but they are the people who are like, so this moment of confusion, like very complex philosophical contact, even, you know, is shown in a, what we say, what you guys would say, so that's a simple way to move a Bunraku puppet or whatever, you know, <laughs> but there is something in there that helps us to understand the world we, we are in and to create meaning. And I think a puppetry, uh, it's a great time. I think it's coming and will be forthcoming as I do think the work of circus as a great popular art form um, will uh, also come back. And, um, and I think it's shameful how little theater is offered for youth, for kids, small kids, even under three, four, five, teens, the greatest audience you can imagine, you know, how little is out there um, and offered to them or supported um, by there's even a, a director in, in, in Sweden who is actually in her normal life, the director of the National Theater in Stockholm after Bergman. And she does work for infants under 12 months. I mean, it's mm. incredible mm. concept. They're sitting in, uh, around a carpet and, um, and actors move in a way that little babies can see them, you know, just shows you how sick, and she believes, not only is it important for her research for theater, but she says it will have, make an imprint. So the, the work and children are drawn to this as they are drawn to good theater instinctively, you know? And, and so I think there is something so important in it and on all levels. And um, so um, this is a, the important uh, a subject we could only touch the top of the iceberg, of the top of the iceberg, you know? So I want everybody to know that this is a big universe as we heard from all the organizations and meetings, what you're involved in, we don't know, <laughs> but it sounds great. 
<laughs> sounds uh, you're like in Star Trek when you hear all these things and we don't understand exactly, but it, you know it's a world out there, a really good one. So um, and um, so really all our respect for for the work you're doing. I feel it's pioneering work. It's work a bit more in the shadows, but it will emerge. It has such a great history and a significant present, but I think it has an even um, a greater future and it's a, a big uh, honor you know to to have you with us and that all three of you um came um to um to uh, to talk to us i know we have a little bit less time but we felt that um to represent that global world also we are moving in and, and you guys are so pioneering also that you have you know these global organizations and puppetry and um, that uh, there is something to to be set for for this so and uh, i hope you will be able the listeners to join us again tomorrow we completely uh, switch uh, as monty python said now to something completely different it will be a playwright to playwrights and the directors from from france um, and mm -hmm. french african uh, penta diop and marine bachelot new Guinea, and will talk to us about their work about what's happening in france at the moment and uh, and uh, how they are experiencing this time, what they're working on, what they are planning. So uh, it's uh, a great, a great change also uh, what is happening, but theaters are slowly uh, reopening. And I hear in July festivals in Germany also will have performances again. So things over there are very different because of the subsidized structure. So I hope um, everybody um, got as much inspiration and also in a way joy from this this conversation it was a great uh, one it's a 150th talk again for us it was a big day uh, we, unimaginable we never thought that would happen and we started large mar last march we thought it might go on for a couple of months because our center was closed all my programming was canceled everything i had carefully put together <laughs> said no you can't get into the building and so i said well then uh, instead of showing all reruns of our talks which we actually have about 500 to 600 programs with that we should you know really um, um an interview archive the moment and it ended up maybe the most uh, uh, closest portrait of a profession in the world around the world and how it reacted you know to to the corona um, crisis and so it's something also for future audiences which might be of um, interest so uh, thank you all goodbye and thanks to howlround for everything and i hope you will uh, hear more and learn us for, join us for the 24 hour India a reading and then with the Literature Festival Berlin we will do readings in New York City for the death of Corona. Maybe we can collaborate, you know, with the puppeteers and others to make that happen. Thank you all, uh, Paulette, Manuel, and Claudia, especially for help making that happen. This was a really important talk. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank Stay you. safe. Bye bye.